Today, the case for Caleb Love. Should he go? Should he stay? It's a conundrum, and so one that we need to unpack. Plus, a look at the scholarship math for how Coach Davis will bring his roster together next season, and his use of the bench, or lack of, and how that all comes together. All of that on today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, beat writer for Sports Illustrated's All Tar Heels website. And I want to thank you for making Locked on Tar Heels your first listen every single day. And for those of you watching on YouTube, your first watch. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, smash the like button, and let's get into it. Well, as I said, we're starting with Caleb Love. This whole week, we're working our way through the remaining four players of the Iron Five that have eligibility. On Monday's show, we talked about Armando Baycott, and today we're going to dive into Caleb Love. Now, if you listened to yesterday's show, you heard Candace Cooper talk about how she has some insider knowledge that these four players are at 95% that they're all going to come back. Is that a 100% guarantee? Absolutely not. There's still 5% chance out there, according to you know her calculations, that um, one or any of these guys might go on to the draft or do other things. And so, since it is not a certainty, we need to keep unpacking and, and trying to decipher what is going to be in their best interest. And so, let me just give you a little bit about Caleb Love's progression statistically from his freshman year to his sophomore year. He raised his points by points per game by almost five and a half points a game. His field goal percentage jumped about five and a half points per game. His three-point field goal percentage jumped almost 10 percentage points a game from last year to this. Free throw percentage jumped by about five point percentage points a game. His rebounding was up. Assist blocks and steals stayed about the same. And his turnovers were down by almost half a turnover a game. So... He's moving in all the right directions, right? There's a lot of good stuff happening for Caleb Love. He had 12 20-point games this season, three of which came in the NCAA tournament, a 30-point game and a 28-point game amongst them. That is huge. As you know, Caleb Love hit some monster shots in some huge moments this season. Perhaps none bigger than that three-pointer over Mark Williams to close out, more or less close out, the Duke game in the final four. So what does all of that come together to mean for Caleb Love's status? Well, let's look at his draft stock. From everything I've looked at on mock drafts, his, his draft stock is all over the place. I've seen it as high as the end of the first round and as low as undrafted. Most sites I've seen, he is somewhere in the second round. And so um, that that's where it's at. My, my estimation on it is that he would be wise to go ahead and declare for the draft with the intention of, of learning information from the NBA about what he can do better, what he can improve. And, and if he gets the right deal from a team, if he gets the right guarantee, go for it. But if not, there's a lot of good reason to come back and we're going to unpack that as well. You you think back to Justin Jackson's sophomore year. After 2015-16, he declared for the draft, got some really invaluable advice about what he needed to do, came back, was the ACC Player of the Year in 2016-17, set the Carolina single-season three-pointers record that season with 105, and, and did great things for himself. He hasn't been able to find a sticking point in the NBA, but boy, he's put himself in a much better position to do so than if he had left after his sophomore year. And I think Caleb Love's in something of a similar boat right now. Really needs to figure out what exactly is it that I've got to do better to make myself a, a higher NBA draft pick. Something that's going to play a huge role in this decision is the name, image, and likeness stuff that I've been talking about a lot this week. Listen, folks, this is very real money that these young men can be making while enrolled as college students at North Carolina. It's a whole new era, a new day and age. 
And so if Caleb Loves decides that he wants to come back to Carolina, it's not because he's eschewing the chance to get money in the NBA. It might be because he can make more money this year in college while still playing in college and having all of those college opportunities. No reason to think that that's not a real opportunity that he's very seriously looking at. Think about it. Think about his visibility that already was there and how much that has now been heightened because of this NCAA tournament run. Caleb Love's done nothing but make himself more money, whether it's on the professional level or on the NIL level coming back to school. Think about also his style, his swagger. Caleb Love carries himself in such a way that agencies and, and people that want to promote things want somebody like that uh, being a, a face of their brand. He's in a good position if he wants to come back to make a lot of money that way. Another thing I think might influence some of Caleb Love's decision if he decides to come back is the competitor in him. Think about getting so close, the, the taste of the national championship that was just right there, almost, almost in Carolina's grasp and just didn't happen. For somebody like him, that's a, that's a very tangible thing that makes you want to come back for more. And I would not be surprised if that plays a role in whatever decision it is that he makes. Caleb Love, as we know, shines on the biggest of stages, and there's no reason he wouldn't want to come back and be part of doing so again. Now, another reason Caleb Love might come back is because there is plenty that he still needs to improve on in his game. You, you noticed in the tournament, things started going really well for him when he got north and south more often, getting to the basket, attacking the rim, and finishing. That's a huge part. It's not just getting to the rim, but finishing once he gets there. Both he and R.J. Davis did a much better job of that in the postseason. Because something he did a lot during the regular season and during his freshman year was just settling for shots rather than getting a better shot for himself or for his teammates. And if he can find a way to harness that and really decide when is the time to pull up from three, when's the time to get to the rim, when's the time to get my teammates involved, I think his decision making continues to improve with another year back in Carolina. Another thing I've said a lot this season is that Caleb often takes too much on his shoulders. Now, that is the sign of a competitor, sure, but it's also the sign of somebody that is still learning to trust his teammates and trust those around him. But I think that's something that's happened with this NCAA tournament run. Obviously, he'll lose Brady, but the other three of these guys, if they all come back, as, as we've talked about, there, there's some of that natural trust built in, and that could really help that as well. So... Caleb Love, could, could he go and get drafted in the NBA draft? Absolutely, he could. Would it be where he thinks he should go in the NBA draft? Probably not. I think in Caleb Love's mind, and probably from a s pure skill set, he is a at, at high-level NBA talent that could be drafted as high as the lottery. But he's got to put it together. So, my, my thought for Caleb, come back have an absurd junior year, you and RJ, Caleb, run things in the backcourt and become the best backcourt in America and make people notice you, make people realize that, that you cannot be uh, dissuaded from being a high NBA draft pick in 2023. So if, if Love is able to put together everything he's capable of, it's ACC Player of the Year level skill. It's um, NCAA All-American skill level type stuff. But again, that's assuming he puts it all together and that's something that Caleb has to and can do. Because right now, when it's pretty, oh boy, it's pretty. But when it's off, it's off. And, and Caleb just needs to find that level of consistency and he can do that. Just needs another year under his belt, I think. Now, part of the thing is that if Love is going to be back next year, it, it creates a couple headaches for Carolina's scholarship math and figuring out how all the pieces fit together. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. But first, let me tell you about Built Bar. Built Bars are great candy bar replacement options covered in 100% real chocolate. Some of the great flavors include mint brownie and brownie batter puffs. And new while supplies last is caramel almond delight. That sounds fantastic. These are all delicious and new flavors are coming out all the time. I'm not sure how Built Bar does it, but they make these bars taste great and then they go back and figure out how to make them healthy and they pull it off every time. 
So go to built.com, scroll down to the macros chart, and I think you're going to love what you see. High protein, low calories, high fiber, low carb. Here's some of the numbers. Just 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, only 4 net carbs, but yet 17 grams of protein. And you compare that to a candy bar that's got about 240 calories, 30 or so grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. That's not what you want. So go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15, and you're going to get 15% off at built.com. Well, I have a big announcement for you as we start to think about the NFL Draft that's upcoming. Starting Thursday, April 28th, tune in to Locked On NFL Draft's live coverage of the 2022 NFL Draft with real-time analysis all three days coming to you from our extensive lineup of experts and insiders. And for those of you dying to know who your team is going to take, catch Odyssey and Locked On's NFL Mock Draft Special, which is hosted by Brian Peacock and former scout Matt Williamson of the Peacock and Williamson NFL Show, all week long leading up to that first pick. Make sure you check that out. So, I want to talk about this scholarship math, and if you wonder what I mean by that phrase, it's this. You might or might not be aware that every college team, unless they're under sanctions, is allowed 13 scholarships per season, and that's specifically basketball. Each sport has its own number of scholarships that it's allotted. Now, one thing that people might not be aware of that I often get asked about is um, scholarship promises made to these young men. These are just one-year promises at a time. Now, if you're committing to one of these players, you're probably wanting and hoping to commit to them for the entirety of their college career. But take, for example, a walk-on. You know, sometimes there, there might be only 12 scholarship-level athletes uh, that you have on your roster, and so you kind of got this one extra scholarship, and you'll see it awarded to a walk-on. Uh, that's that's happened before. KJ Smith, for example, got that a couple years ago. Uh, this is one of the ways that you can remember that these are just one-year commitments. It's not that KJ is going to get that scholarship every year now. It's just that he was the walk-on chosen, and another year it might go to another walk-on. So so keep that in mind that these scholarships can move around if necessary. Well, in this era of, of NIL money going around, in this era of the transfer portal, it's, it's harder than ever to construct a roster and to figure out what your scholarship math is going to look like from year to year. So here's where Carolina's at going into the 2022-23 season. If everything played out without any disruptions as to what is supposed to happen, Carolina would be at 14 scholarships. Let me uh, count those off for you who it is. And again, this is if everything went like nobody transferred, nobody left early for the draft, and people left as they graduated. I'm not saying that's going to happen. That's, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying in a world where that was the case, here are the 14 people that would take Carolina's rosters. The seniors would be Armando Baycott and Justin McCoy. The juniors would be RJ Davis, Dawson Garcia, Anthony Harris, who'd be a redshirt junior, Puff Johnson, Caleb Love, and Kerwin Walton. The sophomores would be DeMarco Dunn and Dontre Styles. And then you've got the four incoming freshmen, Tyler Nickel, Will Shaver, Seth Trimble, and Jalen Washington. And so you add all that up, and that's 14 scholarships. Now, you're probably going to recall that I just said the max is 13, so that is something of a pickle for Carolina. Now, let me further complicate it by telling you this. You might be aware that the NCAA granted all winter sport athletes an extra year of eligibility because of COVID. In previous seasons, ending with 2021-22, the season we just finished, players taking advantage of that COVID year did not count against a team's scholarship math. Meaning, you could have 14 scholarships if you had the money to do so, if one of those was somebody on uh, that, that extra year of COVID eligibility, and that did not count against your scholarship quota. So you could have 14 scholarships, one of whom was, was that. However, I've done some talking to some coaches around the country, and they've been informed by the NCAA that starting this upcoming year, 2022-23, these athletes are now going to count against your scholarship math, scholarship quota. And here's why that's important for Carolina. 
I mentioned those 14 people, but the person I didn't mention in that list was Leaky Black. Because I said in that list, we're imagining that everyone does what they're supposed to do, which means Brady Manick has gone to graduation. He's exhausted his eligibility. Ryan McAdoo has gone to graduation. He's exhausted his eligibility other than the COVID year. And the same is true of Leaky Black. He graduates um, and does, though, have the option, sim similar to Ryan McAdoo would, of coming back for that COVID year. But again, that would count against it. What does that mean? If Leaky Black comes back for a COVID year, a fifth year, that would mean Carolina is now up to 15 scholarships. And that is no bueno. Leaky Black, and then all the others I just named. Baycott, McCoy, Davis, Garcia, Harris, Johnson, Love, Walton, Dunn, Stiles, Nichols, Shaver, Trimble, and Washington. That's 15 guys. So what does that ultimately mean? If Leaky Black's going to come back, then Carolina essentially has to lose two people off of that list from somewhere. Even if Leaky Black doesn't decide to come back, Carolina has to lose at least one athlete has to, something has to give. Well, there, there are a couple guesses as to who that might be. And, and I should say, we're just talking about the scholarship athletes here. So this is not including somebody like Dewey Ferris or Creighton Lebo. Keep, keep that in mind because they're they non-scholarship athletes right now. So, well, I, th I think the first obvious target for Carolina um, to lose probably to transfer is Dawson Garcia. We, we do not know for sure that he's not coming back, at least publicly, we have not been told that. All indications seem to point, though, to the fact that he will transfer somewhere, and that that'll, that'll probably happen in the near future. I wouldn't be surprised if, given everything going on with his family, if he stayed closer to home, maybe transferred to Minnesota or something like that. That is pure speculation on my point. That is, that is based on no, no intel or anything that I've heard or learned. So... If Leaky Black leaves, if if he's gone and Dawson Garcia transfers, then, then you're good. You've got your 13 scholarships. However, if Leaky Black comes back and Dawson Garcia decides to transfer, you've still got one other person that that means has to lead. leave. Excuse me. And, and you've got to imagine all those conversations are going on with the coaching staff and the players right now. Uh, we, we had heard, this, this is not insider knowledge, just... This is what we all know, that Coach Davis was starting to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings this week with his players. And so that's why part of why I would imagine all this information is going to start coming out soon. Because in those meetings is where a player would express his intentions to Coach Davis to leave and transfer. And so uh, while, while you don't want to have to think in these terms, it's, it's the reality of college basketball in this era is that managing a roster is almost impossible. And so I think the prime candidates, unfortunately, and, and we've talked some about this, would be Kerwin Walton, DeMarco Dunn, and maybe Anthony Harris. Um, here's why I name those guys. I don't think any of the freshmen would, <laughs> would opt out of coming. I, th I think that's all happening. Um, I wouldn't name Armando Baycott or Caleb Love or RJ Davis because if they decide to not go to the NBA draft, they're going to be there and they're going to play. Um, of those three, and I guess I would throw Justin McCoy in that potentially as well, although I think less or so with him. Of those four, let's throw in Justin McCoy with that. I think Anthony Harris would be the least likely to transfer. Why do I think that? Well, it's, it's based on how things have played out this year. Remember, um, Anthony Harris was ineligible um, the majority of this season, and yet he's he's around the team the rest of the season. He was in New Orleans, sitting just behind the bench. If he had intentions to leave this team, he wouldn't still be around. He wouldn't stay, right? Does that make sense? So I fully believe and expect Anthony Harris to be back, assuming he's eligible. When it comes to Kerwin Walton... I just, it, it's been a rough year for him in terms of playing time, right? But based on what he did his freshman year, it, he was all over the place, scoring in bunches, um, setting, set the Carolina freshman three-point record. Um, all, all this stuff that he did and did really well, and yet his defense is, is pretty lacking. And unfortunately, that kept him off the court a lot this season with Coach Davis. Um, while Kerwin seems like he's dialed in and locked in, he seems like, just by the nature of what's happened and the way playing time has played out, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him decide to take a transfer opportunity. 
And, and similar with DeMarco Dunn, um, there's nothing that either of them have done or, or said or proven to me that would make me think they want to transfer. It's just opportunity in front of them. Keep in mind, if Love and Davis are back, if Anthony Harris is back, that's further down the depth chart they fall. And, and then you even think about somebody like Seth Trimble coming in. I think he can be a contributor as a freshman. And so um, we look at these guys, and again, if Leaky Black's back, that means two people have to leave or transfer or go to the draft. And so it remains to be seen, but, but my best guesses would be Dawson Garcia and Kerwin Walton. Again, I hope that I'm proven wrong on that because I would love to see both of them continue on as part of this program, but the numbers just aren't there and we got to get something figured out. Well, <clears throat> again, when you have these full 13 scholarships given out, uh, it, it's incumbent upon the coach to figure out how to feed all those mouths. And so we got to talk about that with Coach Davis because the Tar Heels didn't use their bench all that much this season. And we need to look at if that trend is going to continue next season. But before we do that, let's talk about Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models in cars, it's nearly impossible for your local auto parts star store to carry everything you need. Why have to go through all those questions of trying to figure out the make and model and trim of your car when I, I don't know the trim of my car. I have to look it up every time. And then you wait while a salesman tries to find if they've got the parts. But instead, you could just go to Rock Auto, search for the part you need based upon your car, and find it yourself. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. That consistency is something that you and I can believe in. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer and their inventory has everything that you need. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. That's rockauto.com. So as we think about the fullness of this roster, you're probably going to have 13 scholarship level players this year. I don't think we're going to have a, a walk on getting a scholarship or being awarded a scholarship next season. And so that, that's going to be tough for Coach Davis to keep all those players happy and, and get them time or, or opportunity. Um, hopefully some of the freshmen coming in will, will recognize, hey, like I'm, I'm probably going to have to bide my time, similar to what Dontre Styles and DeMarco Dunn did this season. Ultimately, Caroline is going to have to answer this question. Did, did Coach Davis utilize his starters and bench the way he did because of the Iron Five, because they were so good? Or was, it, was Carolina's success down the stretch of the season in spite of that, right? Like, what plays into that is because those five were just phenomenal and he just needed to rely on them because of how cohesive they were? Or did Coach Davis's lack of uh, utilization of the bench hurt the Tar Heels? Pretty obviously did in the Kansas game where you got several players hobbled or the leaky black foul trouble and and then you don't have the horses to be able to pull off that victory. Now, thankfully for the Tar Heels, most of the time they stayed away from injury and foul trouble and, and that made it workable. But is that going to be the case every season? We, we don't know yet. We've got a really small sample size with Coach Davis and it remains to be seen. Now, we, we saw some great... Um, um, time off the bench in the postseason from Puff Johnson, from Dontre Styles. When, when Leaky Black got into his foul trouble in the national championship game, Johnson did a great job coming in. Obviously, he had a, a great offensive uh, period there where he scored 11 points. He did a nice job on Agbaji coming in and playing defense there, drew a charge, had some other things that he did really well. So the question that I'm really curious to have answered is, as Coach Davis gets more comfortable with his personnel, his guys, the men that he's recruited, is that going to allow him to feel more comfortable expanding out to the bench? Or is his style just to play five, six, seven guys and, and go with that and those be the guys that he relies upon? Also, this question is in bold relief, particularly because his predecessor, Roy Williams, 
utilized his bench extensively, going 9, 10, 11 players deep at any given time in any given game if he felt comfortable. And yes, he would pare that down as the season went on um, and, and as talent dictated. But more often than not, Coach Davis was, or excuse me, Coach Williams was utilizing a very deep bench. And so I think that was a major adjustment point this season for Tar Heel. But the question this season is, with 13 scholarship-level players, will Coach Davis utilize that more? Because he's got all this bench help now, what does he do? We're going to have to figure that out. Is, is the way he played things this year, is it a matter of comfort for him as a coach to have five, six, seven guys and lean on that and go to that? Is it based on his NBA experience? Is it based on how he thinks the Tar Heels could play best this year? Again, we just don't know yet. And I think we, there's been a lot of speculation on lots of people's parts. Um, and, and so we just have to wait and see. Obviously, if you've got these four young men returning, Davis, Love, Baycott, and Black, plus whomever jumps into the starting lineup, be it Puff Johnson, Dontre Styles, or maybe a transfer stretch four, if you have the, the capacity to do that in terms of scholarship numbers. We've already seen that Coach Davis trusts those four immensely. Can others break that rotation? Boy, that that is going to be a very interesting thing this upcoming season. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts. Do you think Coach Davis will, will utilize his bench more this year, or do you think he'll continue to stick to those uh, a really just tight rotations? Remains to be seen. Can't wait to find out. I also want to hear your thoughts on Caleb Love. Do you think he should go to the NFL, uh, NFL NBA draft, or do you think he should return? Let me know. Let me know in the comments. Let me know. Uh, reach out on Twitter. Do whatever like that to let me know what's going on, what your thoughts are. Well, and that is it for today's episode of Locked on Tar Heels. Please go subscribe to the show wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Or if you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much. Please subscribe and smash the like button there. And, and would you take a moment to rate and review the show, especially if you listen on Apple Podcasts. That's a really helpful thing there. Five stars uh, if you'd leave a nice comment about what the show means to you. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. Or if you want to follow me, you can follow me at Isaac Shade, I-S-A-A-C-S-C-H-A-D-E. Yes, Shade has a C in it. It's crazy. And if you like what you're hearing, tell a friend. Man, this, this community is really growing and, and would love to continue to bring more people into it. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the... Uh, recruits that were at the spring football game last weekend. We have a brand new recruiting analyst for us on Locked On, and so we're going to have him in straight from Sports Illustrated. Really looking forward to that. And we've got some leaky black love going on. Hashtag leaky lockdown, hashtag comeback leaky, and I may or may not have written a song for uh, pleading with leaky black to come back, and that'll be fun. So thanks so much for making Locked On Tar Heels your first listen every day. And now let me encourage you to make Locked On NFL Draft your second listen. Ryan Tracy and former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL Draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks so much for spending part of your Wednesday talking Carolina sports with me. I hope you have a great day because remember... It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow, peace!